Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Monday, September 4th, Labor Day edition of the Basement Academy. Thanks to the many who have submitted questions. Um, I've got plenty of questions to address this week. Hopefully, I will get to them all in a timely manner. Um, if there are additional questions, feel free to send them in through the little uh, text box there on the church website right under uh, the daily uh, Basement Academy video, okay? Let's begin with a morning psalm. Psalm 64, which seems an appropriate backdrop to this topic, this issue, and how we wrestle with things. So this is um, for the director of music. It's a psalm of David. Hear me, O God, as I voice my complaint. Protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from that noisy crowd of evildoers. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim their words like deadly arrows. They shoot from ambush at the innocent man. They shoot at him suddenly without fear. They encourage each other in evil plans. They talk about hiding their snares. They say, who will see them? They plot injustice and say, we have devised a perfect plan. Surely the mind and heart of man are cunning. But God will shoot them with arrows. Suddenly they will be struck down. He will turn their own tongues against them and bring them to ruin. All who see them will shake their heads in scorn. All mankind will fear. They will proclaim the works of God and ponder what he has done. Let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart praise him. Picturing the words of others as weapons, swords, arrows, my guess is folks on both sides of this issue have spoken words <laughs> like uh, swords and arrows and perhaps have received words as swords and arrows. And so um, none of us are immune from these uh, human realities of speaking sharply against other people. It is so very difficult to be for people while you're also against some things that they may believe. And it doesn't matter what side of this issue you may find yourself on. So I think we do well uh, to, to, to pray this psalm. Psalm 64 begins with, I voice my complaint, and whenever I pray this, my primary complaint, Lord, is about me. I'm, I'm the problem. <laughs> And so may we, may we all uh, guard our tongues and our, and our hearts as well. Okay, some questions from the Academy. I'm just going to dive on in. This first one has to do with being welcomed at Greenwich. So let me just read the question. I have recently been asked by a friend if she would be welcomed in Greenwich. She hears me talk about our church, and I always say all are welcomed through our doors. She seems to be searching for a peace in her life, and her lifestyle now may be in turmoil. She also asked if she and her partner could be married in my church. My answer was no as to marriage, but yes in coming to worship. How do I talk to her about her distress in life if she is struggling with her choices, yet not lose her contact with me if I say the wrong things? Consideration of what God wants me to do and her willingness to ask about my church and its workings with God and his people is a huge part of being an understanding friend. Boy, what a great question. I mean, it, it dovetails. So this question was given <laughs> before yesterday's sermon was preached. And if you were there at Greenwich, you know, I, I spoke the dream I have for our church and I landed on this welcome statement that is at the top of our bulletin. 
to all who are spiritually weary and seek rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who struggle and desire victory, to all who sin and need a Savior, to all who are strangers and want fellowship, to all who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and to all who will come. This church opens wide her doors and offers welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's where I landed the sermon on welcome. And and here's this question about would my friend be welcome? She's asked if she'd be welcome. Now, in hearing uh, the the, the question and maybe a little bit of the sketch, and I I don't know the the details here, so I've got to make some assumptions, but when the, the language of her and her partner, I'm assuming it's a same-sex partner, another woman. And so the easy part about the welcome is absolutely anybody can walk through those doors and we are obligated in the name of Jesus Christ to welcome them as image bearers of God, as those for whom Christ has died, as those who sin and need a savior, right? Because that's all of us, right? And so the easy part is the welcome. Come, please, come as you are. Whoever you are, however you are, come. There are none who are righteous, right? There are none who are holy. So so come into the fellowship. Come as you are, but but join us in that, that journey of not remaining as we are but becoming like Jesus Christ, of renouncing, forsaking those aspects of our lives that weigh us down, that diminish us, that are sin, that are wrong, that do not accord with the the will of the Father. And for some of us are besetting sins, our tongue, some are maybe um, lust, uh, greed, um, pride, anger. There's any number of the seven deadly sins, right? Pride, envy, wrath, um, uh, sloth, lust, avarice, um, um, and gr- uh, gluttony. That's right. Get, get that last one. And so the besetting sins are many that we all walk in with. The challenge is most of us find a way to excuse our own brand of sin while we look at another person's life. And that's, we don't struggle with that but they sure do, and we want to judge them. And so I talked about getting the log out of our own eyes. And so I think this question is so wonderful. Um, and I think the, the questioner, who, who I, I take to be a member of, of Greenwich, understands that we would not uh, officiate, I would not, Eric would not officiate a same-sex wedding uh, at the church. Now, in a welcoming, gracious spirit, I would refer that person. So welcome to come to Greenwich and join us fellow sinners in becoming more like Christ and forsaking uh, your sin. And so if this person wished to be married, um, you know, as a civil arrangement, right? I, I do not see marriage as anything other than a man and a woman. That's what scripture tells me. And so I decline I, I do not believe I'm authorized by God to officiate two men or two women uh, joining in what the state now calls marriage. I believe marriage is just a man and woman. And so um, so I would make a, re- a referral to somebody uh, if they wish to be married by uh, a religious figure, then there are, I've got presbytery colleagues who, who are not, bound in conscience. My conscience is not yet free. And I would use some of that language if I got a chance to talk to this individual. It's not a matter of being against that person or not being welcoming. It's that we are a community of conscience. So a church is a community of conscience. We believe there are transcendent realities, transcendent truths to which we are accountable. And so I believe I'm accountable for my actions. And so I would not participate in that because I do not believe that's a marriage, uh, two men or or, or two women. And so I'm not yet free in my conscience. I might change over time. I don't think I will, and I'm not intending to, but 
but I am not yet free. And so I would try to be as in, in gracious a, a conversation with this individual. And so, I mean, this question comes, goes right to the heart of things with respect to this truth, grace challenge, this narrow way that we are called to walk. Be the friend of this individual. Now recognize they may not understand you when you say you're welcome to come to church, but my church would not marry you and your partner. Those are not incongruous. Those are not help that person as best you can, but by, by explaining, but we are a conscientious community. In the same way, when we, we go to certain places, we, we, we are not free to act as we wish. There is decorum. There are um, uh, regulations and responsibilities that that organization, whether I go to a concert, I, I go to a, a, a country club and, you know, uh, to play golf, I, I, I go out to dinner, I'm, I'm, I, I go into federal workspace, uh, I, I get on a plane and I've got to take my shoes off. There are rules. And so I'm free to fly on any uh, airplane in the United States. I'm not free to go there without taking off my belt, taking off my shoes, you know, dropping my keys, going through the search process, the screening process. And so there, there's freedom and there's limits, okay? And so maybe, maybe you can talk to the person. It's an opportunity to bear witness to the larger story of God's truth because here's the reality. Most of us want our cake and eat it too. We want to be free to do as we wish without limits. And so the state no longer limits marriage between two individuals of the same sex, two men, two women, may now be married. They're permitted to be married by the state but not every church will do that. That does not mean that church is not welcoming. It means that church is a community of conscience. It is bound to a higher understanding of truth and, and God's purposes. And so perhaps one way, uh, again, be the friend of this person, uh, express sympathy for their tension and, and the struggle in their life, but but say, you know, this is a place where you could come as you are and grow to be more than you are. Because that's what we desire, to grow to be more than we are right now. And so if this individual wished to be celibate, um, that's, I mean, that, that's the pathway for any same-sex individual. It's not that we would turn away gay people. It's that we would call people to celibacy the same way we do heterosexual individuals. We call them to celibacy if they are not in the covenant of marriage. So um, anyway, I, I hope this is helpful, but I think there's something about explaining that the church is a conscientious community that's not, see in fact, we're seeking not to be harmful to people, but to be helpful to people. So I think this language, come as you are, but then come be among us and grow to be more than you are and find in Jesus Christ the deepest hunger of, of the life. And so I still stand by the welcome statement uh, at Greenwich. So a second question, um, and this really is kind of all just comes as a cry for help. So difficult to put into words what I myself have been through with this journey into a world I have no control over. I feel as, it, as if I have wronged someone whom I love very much and that I need to try to seek out again and listen to what I refused to a few years ago. Why he thinks he is like he is. This is not a stranger or someone I barely know. This is someone I thought of as a son and I love him. The world of his is foreign to me yet is like a web at times to him, not knowing who he is, yet crying out for help as to why he is. What to say or do to help such a close relationship that has been nurtured one way for years turn and disappear into a puff of smoke. Help. Wow, thank you for the, the honesty uh, of this question. Again, I don't know who's asking these questions. Um, some assumptions. It's a non-family member, so you treat like a son, but not a son. So I'm assuming it's a non-family member. Perhaps it's a, a, a nephew or something like that. Um, so this friend, or perhaps now former friend, 
appears to be living a gender non-conforming life. I, I, I sense perhaps uh, he is, is gay. And so you said or did something that offended uh, this individual, perhaps by your questions or maybe the tone of voice in your question or maybe, you know, a statement that, that, that was made. And so you tried at some level to understand that world um, and, and your friend, why he is the way he is. Again, I'm, I'm reading into that, but assuming the individual's gay and perhaps wishing not to be, but then being drawn further into that uh, that that world. Um, and, and so the first thing I would do is to say, you might want to go to the person, again, if they'll have you in conversation, it sounds like maybe not, perhaps you could write them then, but ask for forgiveness and say you're sorry for what you may have said or done or not said or not done uh, intentionally or unintentionally, right? Again, you, you, you know what, what happened there. Say you're sorry. And that you value the friendship, you value the relationship, and you ask for forgiveness. That's the place to always begin when relationships have been ruptured, have been wounded, have been harmed in some way. We forgive. And we ask for forgiveness. We, we extend sympathy and, and we express our sympathy. I'm sorry. I, 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 I know I said some things. I probably said them in the wrong way, in the wrong spirit. Um, I'm trying to understand. I, I don't understand uh, well. Um, can we talk? Will you forgive me? Could you, could you ever forgive me? So I think that's the, the place um, to start Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so we, we build, Jesus built that in, forgiveness of one another, our forgiveness of, from the Lord, and we seek to extend and receive forgiveness uh, from others. Um, you may not fully understand what you said or did, and so there, that becomes a second place of inquiry. Hey, I'm sorry, it seems like we're not as close as we were. I may have said something or done something and I'm not even aware of what it is. Could we talk about that? So if you know what the offending event is, apologize for it. But, but if you don't, then, then certainly you could inquire about there. Um, the tension comes if the, the offending event or word is over some kind of deep, convictional, conscientious, here we are back to conscience again, a conscientious concern that you have. Again, to quote Ted Lasso, who was quoting Walt Whitman, be curious, not judgmental. And so something I've, I've with other people, um, and I believe I'll tease this out in one of the questions uh, later this week, I sometimes say, help me understand. I don't understand this. I genuinely want to understand. And so can you get curious about things? Most of us tend to be more judgmental than we realize. You know, we, we've already made up our mind and sometimes it leaks out through our tongue. So our tongue becomes the arrow, the sword that, that wounds the other, other person. And so there may be a genuine conscientious or convictional difference. That is, you believe um, living in a, a part, you know, gay partnered uh, way is not God's will and, and purpose for the human family. And this purpose, and this other person may not be thinking about God so much as I'm looking for companionship, I'm looking for friendship, I'm looking for intimacy, and why can't I love who I love? So they may not necessarily be thinking about it in a biblical or theological way. And so these are hard places to explore when our consciences are formed by Scripture and the other person's conscience may be formed more by experience or, or other um, other sources. <laughs> um, and so 
this this is this is what I was talking about again yesterday in the, in the message. How do we stay in relationship with people when we differ? How do we work through our differences with grace and truth? How do we not give away our own conscience and our own convictions while also maintaining relationship? And so Jesus is our exemplar. He's the one who was able to do that. He could stay in relationship without giving away his conv- his convictions. Now, one of his convictions was people are really important. And so he went to the tax collectors. He went to the sinners. He, he went to the prostitutes. He went to the outcasts. And he was willing to suffer the reputational harm, the, 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 the tut-tutting and the, and the wagging of the finger uh, by the Pharisees. He was willing to suffer the reputational harm by staying in relationship. But he also would labor for the Pharisees themselves. And so he wanted them to to know the truth as well. And so Jesus is uh, the the exemplar. So I don't know if I'm offering a whole lot of help, but, but, but it's say you're sorry, try to find out what the offense was. If you know, ask for a forgiveness and apology for offending that person. That was not the intent. And then maybe explain, you, you know, you have a, a conscientious belief formed by the scriptures. And you say, I realize that that may not be shaping your life. And so it's wrong of me to place upon you a, a set of beliefs that you have not come to understand or come to embrace. And so, you know, something around that, that why would I hold somebody who doesn't claim to be a Christian and follow uh, God's word to a standard <laughs> that they've never heard of or, or know about, right? So it's, we need to be careful there. Um, I just want to offer a couple scriptures. Um, uh, Romans 12, verse 18, if it is possible, and it may not be, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So do everything in your power to pursue this relationship, pray for the person, extend you know grace to the person. And then Romans 14, just two chapters later, verse 19. So Romans 12, 18, and then Romans 14, verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. And some of you are thinking, well, you can't have peace if we don't agree on these things. And you may be right. Right? Insofar as it depends on you, if it's possible, live at peace with all people. Do, do whatever it takes to, for peace and mutual edification. Mutual edification is building each other up. To edify is to build up. And so let that person build you up by informing them about their life and about their struggles and about their desires. And so there might be something that's in there. My guess is as important as that relationship has been to you, your relationship is important to that person as well. And, and they may not understand forgiveness. They may not live in that, in that context. And so I, I wish I could say more, but I th- say you're sorry, apologize, get curious, um, and, and pray and, and lean into the relationship still. Um, let me just, 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 answer the last question. It, it, I'll give a short answer to this one. I've been a little wordy, maybe in the other two. What is R-O-G-D? Rapid, that's the R, onset gender dysphoria. Rapid onset gender dysphoria. Um, it, it's a concept that is um, highly dubious in the um, gender ideology movement, uh, a researcher, professor, uh, she was a med school professor back in, I think, 2016 to 19 time frame, observed a number of adolescent young women wishing to be trans, wishing to be boys, wishing to transition from girls to boys. And it seemed 
as if it were a contagious experience. And so uh, some of the, the research methods have been called into question. The conclusions of uh, Lisa Littman's um, um, research has been called into question uh, by trans activists and advocates and fr allies of the LGBTQ community, particularly the transgender community. The notion of rapid onset is there was no history in the young person's life of gender dysphoria, the incongruence with their, their birth sex, biological sex. Whereas the, 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 the um, clinical definition of gender dysphoria is something that is, exists over time. It, the onset of it was early childhood three years old, five years old, seven years old, and it has persisted over time, okay? That's classic gender dysphoria, clinical diagnosis for gender dysphoria. Rapid onset gender dysphoria, there's no history of incongruence with uh, the birth sex, uh, biological sex, and then boom, in this adolescent experience, uh, I forget what the ages were, maybe 14 to 16, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, gender dysphoria and the pursuit of transition. And so, um, so that, that is what ROGD is, rapid onset gender dysphoria. It's the notion that this may, through the influence of social media, peer group influence, like other things that we know uh, peers can influence um, adolescent, uh, you know, all, all people can be influenced, but certainly adolescents can be uh, influenced by their peer group. So it seems in the research of Lisa Littman, which has been discredited, the paper was written, then retracted and denounced and the like. And so again, this is the ideological aspect of the gender justice movement. Why shouldn't we allow this research to continue? If there is a social influence and a social contagion dimension to this in some cases, ought not we know about that so that we don't um, medically intervene perhaps too quickly in somebody's life when they're merely following a fad? So anyway, that's the short answer. There's probably a longer answer, but um, I think we're out of time. So, uh, yeah, three questions. Thank you for these questions. We'll pick up with some more questions tomorrow. And again, invite you, if you do have additional questions, to send them on in, and we'll try to take them on, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the mercies that you have shown to us through Jesus Christ. As we struggle in relationships, as these two questioners have spoken, similar questions and the desire to be good friends, and we wish to be a church that welcomes all, Lord, uh, help us. <laughs> help these individuals in relationship. Help us as a church family to, to be for people and yet also for your truth and the life of Jesus Christ in all people. And so guide us uh, into this new week as we wrestle with these and other questions, and guide us as we seek to show uh, our love to you by showing our love to our neighbors. As we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God bless you this day with a heart that loves your neighbor as yourself, sacrificially, <laughs> deeply, humbly. And may God's Spirit teach you more of the life of Christ as you love your neighbor this day. Amen.